Imagine that you had a car accident, a bad one, a really bad one. Your Prius took on a Mack truck hauling steel piping and lost. Blood is everywhere. Lacerations cover your arms, legs, and face. Bruises blend with burns, leaving little unadulterated skin. Your muscles are twisted and torn. A severe concussion has left you in a fog, barely aware of your surroundings. Paramedics struggle to keep you conscious, but your mind slips in and out of delirium. You're terrified. You don't know what happened, why this happened, or even who you are. You will survive, but your recovery will be grueling and painful and may take months, even years. You may lose your home, your job, even your family. You realize that the life you once knew is now gone, and you will never be the same person again. Now imagine that same pain, that same fear, that same suffering, but no one else can see it. There was no car accident. No paramedics are rushing to your aid. It all happened inside of you. When you seek help for your injuries, you're met with annoyance, disdain, even disbelief. You attempt to relate your suffering to your family, friends, and colleagues, but no one understands. How could they? Why would anybody believe this hodgepodge of bizarre, invisible, unrelated symptoms that you claim are making your life unbearable? And even if people believed you, they never accept the outlandish premise that the damage wasn't caused by some massive semi-tractor trailer truck, but instead by one tiny little pill. A pill that your doctor ironically prescribed to make you feel better. Welcome to the world of benzo withdrawal. Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Hello, this is Dee, your host, and welcome to episode two of the Benzo Free Podcast. I am really happy you joined me today. Um, I mean that sincerely. I always do. Just I'm happy that anybody wants to take the time and listen to me talk. That's kind of cool. So thanks for joining me. If my voice sounds a bit lower than normal, that's because I'm recording this episode over the holidays and I'm fighting this nasty head cold. So I'll try to edit out my sniffles and coughs and everything and, and not make it too disruptive. So thanks. That opening was from the preface of my book, Benzo Free. Um, I wanted to use it here because it's an analogy I came up with to try to relate the experience of benzo withdrawal to other people. This is something that anybody who has experienced it directly knows is almost impossible to relate to other people. I found the experience of benzo withdrawal to be ineffable. That's a term I came across during my withdrawal, and I thought it's perfect to use it here. If you don't know, ineffable basically means indescribable. It's that you can't put it to words. It's extremely difficult to relate to somebody else using language. And that is benzo withdrawal. Those of us who've been through it know how tiresome and how difficult it is to relate this experience to people who have not experienced it directly, to our family, to our friends, to our doctors especially. It is very difficult to explain what this is truly like. And so we come up with new creative ways. And so that was my attempt at a creative way of explaining my experience. It was a hit or miss. I don't know, but that's what I came up with. And I thought that was a decent opening for today's, for today's episode. Because today is all about my Benzo story. <laughs> um, we're going to skip Q&A. We're just going to do the feature. And the feature is just going to be my experience with Benzos. I struggled for a long time about using, you know, my benzo story as the topic for an entire episode of this podcast. I really did. I've gone back and forth. I thought, you know, it's pretty well laid out in the book. I talk a lot about my experience with benzos in the book, so if you really want to know it, you could go there. And I get that. But I have to realize that a lot of you probably haven't read the book and may never read the book, and that's fine. 
So I thought at least I could just, you know, block out one episode and tell you my story here. There's a few things that I think that gains, and, and let me just run through those really quick before I move on. Number one, by dedicating one episode to my story, it's easy to skip. If you don't want to listen to my Benzo story, then just skip over episode two. Done. You don't have to worry about it. Second is, to be honest, I actually like telling my story. I'm posting a podcast, so I think talking about my experiences and talking about things probably aren't something I mind doing too much since I'm doing this. So I, I don't mind talking and I don't mind talking about myself. I'll, I'll, I'll admit it. That's why I'm here. But that's not the real reason. The, the third reason that I'm doing this is to make it relatable. If you noticed amongst the Benzo community, for those of you who have been involved in it, you'll see that telling your story is kind of like a, a litmus test. When you first meet somebody on an online chat or a Benzo discussion board or somewhere like that, we often share our stories. It's how we say hello. So it becomes almost this litmus test, you know, of, hey, well, yeah, you've been through it. I can tell by what you're describing. But most of all, it's just a way of us relating to each other and saying, oh, yeah, I had that too. Or, yes, I had that symptom. God, yeah, that sucked. I went through that. It, it's a way of creating a bond. It's a way of knowing that somebody else is going through this and I'm not alone. And that's the main reason I'm doing this. So, so please forgive me for being self-serving and dedicating a whole episode to this subject matter, but I'm doing it. And if you don't want to listen to it, move on and try episode three, four, or five, go on down the line. But for those who do want to listen to it, hang in there. We're going to talk a little bit about my Benzo story. And before we get much further, don't forget to pop over and visit our website at benzofree.org and also to leave us some feedback. We really want to hear from you. We want your opinions, your ideas, your additions, corrections, whatever you have, your personal story. Anything you have to share with us, we do want to hear it. So please let us know. You can give us feedback at benzofree.org slash feedback or email us directly at podcast at benzofree.org. Thanks. And before we get too far into today's episode, don't forget that this podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. Now, before I dive too deep into my story, I do want to cover just a, a quick thing, and that is please remember that my experience with benzos is extreme. I am currently in protracted withdrawal, which is withdrawal 18 months beyond my last dose of benzos. And that puts me in the minority, significantly so, that only 10 to 15% of people who were on long-term benzos wind up in protracted withdrawal. I am one of those lucky ones. I also took clonopin or clonazepam, which is one of the hardest drugs to recover from. So please know that if you're listening to this, I am an extreme case, okay? So when you hear my story, please know that your experience, if you haven't started yet, will most likely be better. Okay, will be easier than mine. So please don't think you're going to go through what I went through. Everybody's experience is different. And that's a key point to keep in mind. Okay, I'm not going to harp on that too much. I'm going to move on. Let's dive into my benzo story. <laughs> it's kind of cool with this cold because I can, you know, lower my baritone voice down and keep lowering it down. And, um, you know, almost sound like I'm doing some voiceover for some slasher film. But, you know, so so I'm having some fun with that today. I don't know the date, the actual date when I was first prescribed a benzo, but it was sometime in the year 2002. I know that just from my journals and going back and keeping track of some notes here and there. At the time, I was struggling with stomach issues, as I so often have done. You see, I I was born with a, a bad stomach. Um, I had some problems growing up. My um, I had my first... Oh, I'm sorry, first upper GI at six months old, and I had my first pre-ulcer condition at five years old. I was enough about that, but just so you know, I've lived with stomach issues my entire life. We all have our burdens. That's just one of mine. So I went into the doctor and complained about stomach issues again to see if there was something else we could try, and he prescribed clonazepam. For most of you realize clonazepam, which is generic for clonopin, is a benzodiazepine. Anyway, he thought maybe anxiety was part of my problem, even though I never complained about anxiety to him, and I've never been officially diagnosed with any anxiety issue. But he thought maybe this might help, and he prescribed it to me. And there were no warnings. 
no mention of dependence, no mention of withdrawal, no mention that this would have any problems. Just here, try this and see if it works. He didn't prescribe it short term. He prescribed it long term. He said, if it works, you keep taking it. I trusted my doctor back then. This is what you did. You know, you go to your doctor, they prescribe something, you take it. So I started taking the drug. I was on clonazepam for over 12 years, 11 years on the medication and then tapered for about a year and a half. I started at 0.5 milligrams daily and eventually upped my dosage to 2 milligrams daily. During this time, I realized in hindsight, I was intolerant. I just didn't know it at the time. There were many symptoms, many signs that I look back on and see, uh, vertigo, slurred speech, all kinds of things. But I never, you know, even related this to the drug I was taking. I just didn't think about it. In those first 11 years, not one doctor, and I had switched doctors a few different times, ever suggested I come off the drug. They just kept prescribing it. It was kind of weird, you know. But here's the, here's the part that I have to own myself. In those entire 11 years, I never looked it up. I never asked about the drug. I never pulled it up online. I never researched. I don't know why. It's weird. I think back, it's 11 freaking years, and I never once looked up the drug I was taking. That's a mistake I ain't going to make again. <laughs> but, oh, man, it's just hard for me to think why in 11 years did I never look it up, but I didn't. You know, we get busy. We have our lives. I think it was helping me a little bit, although it had plenty of side effects, too. I just didn't relate to them. I didn't know. But I never looked it up, and that's on me. I take some responsibility here. I never looked into this drug to find out what was going on. I tell you right now, if I had, I would never have been on it for 12 years. That's just not me. If I had known what it could lead to, I never would have kept taking it. But I didn't. So I share some responsibility here. The tipping point for me was the summer of 2012. So about 10, 11, I guess 11 years, yeah. 11 years on the drug in the summer of 2012. I had, I had moved to Aurora, Colorado with my wife. Um, we got an apartment down there. Our home was still in the mountains, but we needed to move closer so she could be near her new job. And so we picked up an apartment down in Aurora. And again, I switched doctors because, you know, I needed somebody closer since we weren't spending a lot of time in the mountains anymore. So on her initial appointment, when I told her about the clonazepam I was taking, she said without any real alarm or concern that I should start to wean off the drug. This is the first doctor, like I mentioned, at 11 years to even suggest that I shouldn't be taking this drug or shouldn't keep taking this drug. Still, I didn't think much of it. She prescribed me um, 40 milligrams of Prozac, um, actually Fluxotine, which is generic for Prozac, to help me. She said, take this, get established on it, and then it will help me with the transition. Again, I wasn't too freaked out. I thought it was curious, but I didn't think too much of it. So I went home with the prescription and I started taking the drug. A few nights later, and this is actually sometimes hard for me to talk about, but a few nights later, my whole life, the life I knew, changed in an instant. See, I was, I was trying to sleep on the twin bed in the front bedroom of, of this two-bedroom apartment that we were living in Aurora. So since I couldn't sleep, I opened my iPad and I started to research clonopin. It didn't take long for the panic attack to kick in. I came across horror story after horror story about benzodiazepine withdrawal. I was terrified, petrified, and freaking out. In hindsight, I realized this was my very first full-blown panic attack. I'd never had them regularly. I don't think I ever had one before, to be honest. And I never wanted to have one again. I mean, I, I had this drug inside of me that had been in for years and was doing damage to me. That's how I interpreted this. And I just wanted it out of me so bad. And I was, I was totally freaking out. So I paced in the room for hours. I did more research. I even got online with a counselor. You know, they had one of those websites that I could log on and talk to somebody online. And um, this counselor actually helped me a little bit, brought me down a bit. I continued to pace in the room for hours and until daylight came along. Now, I soon realized after the fact that my panic attack wasn't only because of the horror story, but also a kind of adverse reaction to the Prozac. 
the dosage was probably a little too high for somebody who suffers with anxiety, as I learned later by talking to a few experts. And so it should have been managed better, but it wasn't. And so I stopped taking the Prozac the next day. The following week or two were some of the lowest I'd ever been in my life. I was flat out depressed, scared, more panic attacks, shaking, you, you name it. I had all kinds of problems and I basically felt my life was over. It was, it was bad. And, and it, was, it was a little stronger than I should have at the reaction at that time. And so, and it still took me a while to put all the pieces together to realize I was in tolerance withdrawal already. So anxiety was already a problem for me. I just didn't see it creeping on. My wife did. <laughs> in hindsight, she saw it creeping up, but I didn't. So that night was the beginning of my new journey, the withdrawal chapter of my life. So I figured I needed to deal with things. Um, thank God when I researched Klonopin, I learned quickly that stopping cold turkey is the worst thing you could do. And so I knew better than to do that, but I needed to get help and I needed to figure out how to deal with where I'm at and if I can, you know, fix this. I knew I wanted to withdraw that first night, but I'd read enough to know that I needed help in doing so. I, I understood cold turkey was not an option for me. Um, so I quickly, you know, decided to find some help. Um, I went back to the new doctor, but, um, after the Prozac issue, I knew that she wasn't the right one. Um, I went back to the doctor actually who prescribed the, um, the clonazepam 12 years ago or 11 years ago, but, um, obviously that didn't go well. That's another story for another time. So finally I went back to a doctor that I had when we lived in the mountains. And, um, I, I called him Dr. V in the book and he's this idyllic small town kind of doc, that, that kind of attitude. Um, whereas he takes his time, he'll sit with you and talk through things. Um, he, he knows he doesn't, you know, get overreactive about anything. He's just that calming presence for me that I wanted in a doctor. I told him just clearly that, look, based on the research I've done, I, I want to withdraw. I do no longer want this drug in my body. And he said, okay, I'll work with you. But then he told me something. He said he didn't want me to start taper yet. He wanted me to wait six months. And yeah, I know. Wait six months to start getting this drug out of my body. This was not something I wanted to hear. I, I kind of freaked out when I left his office um, and seriously considered finding another doctor. But but then, then things started to hit me, and in hindsight, I started to put things together. Um, see, I had uncovered the Ashton Manual before I went back to see Dr. V. And again, I'm going to go ahead and talk about this real quickly here because you can't talk about this enough. If you haven't read the Ashton Manual and you are on benzos, please do so. Okay, you can find a direct link to it on our website at benzofree.org slash Ashton. There's a description of her, of her work, and of the manual with a big blue button that takes you right to the manual. So please check that out. Okay, I beg of you, if anything else you do, if you find yourself dependent on benzos, is read the Ashton manual and, of course, work with your doctor. Everything I say here is just my opinion. Please remember to work with your doctor. You don't want to withdraw without a doctor, as I didn't want to. So, moving on. Dr. V was walking a very fine line in that appointment. He realized I was not mentally stable. And I think he knew that people who try to withdraw from benzos who aren't mentally stable don't usually succeed. And not only that, but if you don't succeed the first time, the second, third, and fourth times can be more and more complicated and more difficult in the process we call kindling. So, you know, I think he knew I needed to be in a better place. And so he had me wait. And you know what? In hindsight, that was the best thing that ever happened to me because I wasn't stable. I needed to find some tools to help me stabilize mentally. So I went to work. The next month or two were, well, almost <laughs> were hell. <laughs> they, they weren't fun. Um, I couldn't stop obsessing about the benzos. Um, I kept thinking about what they were doing inside my body and damage they were doing. Um, I couldn't think about what my future held and would I ever even get free of this and how long would it take? I had anxiety, depression, more panic attacks. 
lost work, um, closed off from the world, became really isolated. I realize now that I was in tolerance during that time and already dealing with some withdrawal symptoms. But I did do a few things right. I, I started my sessions with a new psychologist, and she was great, really supportive of my struggles. Got a membership to a nearby gym and started working out and swimming again. Lap swimming was really helpful for me. I also came across yoga. I mean, I, of course, I've heard of it before, but I started taking a class at the gym, and it was really interesting. In fact, in that yoga class, I met some other people who were going through the same thing I was going through. So it was very enlightening to me and, and helped, me, helped me find a couple friends who um, knew, knew what I was going through and understood my, my trials. Um, I also discovered meditation at that time, and meditation and yoga both have been with me ever since. Over the following months, my tools slowly helped me kind of stabilize and get back to a better mindset. And um, six months passed, and guess what? It was time for me to go back to Dr. V and see if we can start that taper. It was February of 2013. I, I had my plan in hand. I mean, I had researched benzo withdrawal in excess, including the Ashton Manual, over and over again. I knew exactly what I needed to do. My mood had improved, um, and I thought, you know, this is where I need to be. And actually, Dr. V said he was impressed. He could see that I had stabilized, and that meant a lot to me. I felt like I did the work and made a difference. Not only that, I felt that I had taken charge of my own recovery. And this, this became a huge factor for me throughout all my recovery is that I'm in charge. And that provides some ownership, some responsibility, but also some flexibility to know that I'm the one that's going to make these decisions going forward. And so I think going in with that attitude to Dr. V made a difference. He initially suggested a faster taper than I planned on, but I... I calmly told them that based on my research, um, I thought a slower taper was the best course of action for me, and he agreed. So we settled on a quarter milligram every two weeks reduction um, with the flexibility to stop and stabilize at any dosage for as long as I needed. Um, I also decided to taper without substitution with diazepam, so I decided to stay just on the drug I was on. This may not have been the best choice for me in hindsight, but at the time... The last thing I wanted to do was to add another drug to my system, and I just couldn't, I couldn't think through that. I couldn't, I couldn't accept that, so I decided to stay with the clonazepam. He agreed to my plan and prescribed the proper dosages, and guess what? I was on my way, and that was a huge step. I was ready to start tapering. So my, my taper was interesting. Um, I wound up taking much longer than planned, and, you know, I'm glad I did. I took 16 months to finally taper off clonazepam. Uh, in the beginning, I didn't have many problems, but as I got down below the one milligram level, which was half my original dose, um, my symptoms became stronger and I had more and more difficulty. And eventually it became a, a pretty difficult road. My last dose of clonazepam was August 20th, 2014. I am very proud of that day. It, it's, it's a major accomplishment to taper slowly off this medication and become benzo-free. And anybody who has done that should be very proud. This can be very hard to do. Unfortunately, uh, it wasn't the end of my symptoms. In fact, it was barely the beginning. And thus began the acute withdrawal stage for me for the next 18 months. And this was the hardest. This was pure hell at times. I barely left the house. I couldn't socialize. I couldn't be around people. Anxiety was through the roof. Um, so was cognitive problems. So was pain. So was um, just everything. It was very intense. And at times, not only could I not leave my home, but I couldn't leave my bed. <sighs> I didn't sleep for days on end. And I just wanted it to be over. But... I did get through those 18 months of acute withdrawal, and I moved on to the protracted phase. But before I move on too quick, let's go take a look at the symptoms I had real quickly here. And these are the symptoms I had through taper, through acute, and into protracted, which is where I'm at now. Like most people going through withdrawal, I had a wide variety of symptoms, and they came and went throughout various stages. Some lasted the whole five years I've been through this. Some started early and then disappeared. Others have come on late. Um, that's just how symptoms work with, there's really no rhyme or reason with benzo withdrawal. This may look like a really long list and it is. Please remember, I, 
Uh, most people are going to have far fewer symptoms than I had. But due to the fact that I was on clonopin, due to the fact that I was on a long time and other factors and whatever plays into it, um, I'm an extreme case. So I have a lot of symptoms. I'll go into more detail on these later, but for now, let me just do a quick rundown. Um, I'm not going to discuss these too much in detail because I do in the book, and if you want to, you can read that there. But for now, I just want to give you a, a brief overview of what I went through. I had achesia, which is inner restlessness. I had anger and irritability. That's not fun. Anxiety, depression, anxiety, probably the strongest of all my symptoms. Benzo belly, digestive issues, abdominal distension, cramping, all just terrible stuff. Um, body sensations, I had tingling, numbness, pain, cognitive issues, and memory loss. This caused me a lot of problems with work. Dizziness and vertigo, I had that even during tolerance. Emotional blunting, I was basically just emotionally numb for 12 years, and now that's come back. And that's really difficult to handle when you're not used to these emotions. Facial paresthesia, which is a sensation of um, spiders on my face. I had them mostly on my left side, and that'll freak you out. Flushing and sweating, I would sweat through the sheets many nights. Heart palpitations sent me to the ER more than once. Inflammation, insomnia, chronic insomnia, still have it to this day. Muscle tics, tremors, shaking, tightness, aches, pains, pulls, tears, all the muscle issues. It makes sense because many of these drugs are excellent muscle relaxants, so when you come off of them, your muscles lock up. Pelvic floor dysfunction, um, groin pain, abdominal pain, um, these really... These sent me to several specialists before I could find out what was going on, and still, I'm not totally sure. I had panic attacks. Those were new for me. Personality changes. My wife noticed those, and I myself have noticed them too. Restless legs. Sensory hypersensitivity. For me, nasal. I would smell things that other people didn't smell. I had slurred speech, throat tightening, thrush, which is an oral infection. Tinnitus. Chronic tinnitus comes and goes several different types. And urinary issues, um, which that combined with the digestive issues, make it very hard to travel, even to work in some places. And that's kind of my list. I, there are other things I'm not listing here that I've had periodically, but that's the basic list for me. I know, that's a lot of things. And I realize that maybe not every single one of them is tied to the benzo withdrawal. But these are common ones across the board for people who go through severe withdrawal experiences. And I can tell you right now that 90, 95% of them are. I, it just makes sense. There's no other explanation for what I went through. It's really hard. It's just really hard. It's really embarrassing. People don't understand. Going through withdrawal, your self-esteem is about as low as it can get. I mean, you have to be taken care of. If you can, if you have somebody to take care of you, you can't handle things. You can't handle things other people can handle. You can't handle stress other people can handle. You, you, you're shaking. You're, you have tinnitus. You, you have digestive problems. You can't eat anything. You can't go out. You can't be with people. The limitations are endless, and it really eats away at your self-esteem. And when you add work on top of that, that you can't work and you can't help provide for your family and you can't keep a job, my self-esteem took a huge shot and, and still is. It's still try, I'm still trying to recover. I'm hoping that with the podcast and book and other stuff, I can find a new career path and that I can make just enough money to make a living off this and help people as I do. But, you know, who knows? I don't know if that'll pan out. Um, I Maybe I'll go try to pick up another database job here, but I don't know if I can. I have to, right now, I'm still struggling with the cognitive function and, and it's, it's just really hard. Anyway, let's let's move on and get through this. <laughs> uh, August 20th, 2018, I was four years benzo-free. You know, just saying that feels kind of good. Overall, I'm doing okay. I, I Most days are good. I still have bad ones. I still get waves. I still get symptoms. But I'm a hell of a lot better than I was in the middle of acute withdrawal. It has gotten better. Anxiety and cognitive issues are still there. Those I really wish would be gone, but they're not. But they're a little better, I think. I go to counseling. I do yoga. I do meditation. I do these things just to kind of keep me on par and try to keep up with things. I am now getting back out into the real world. I'm doing this podcast. That's kind of cool. Um, I got the book out. 
I am now spending more time with some friends. I'm seeing family. I'm more social by far than I was. I can do more and more things, but I still have a lot of restrictions. Traveling is difficult for me. Some jobs would be difficult because of cognitive, but also because of hell, urinary and digestive problems. These aren't fun and these limit what I can do. I can't eat a lot of places I go. And, but these are my problems. And you know, the main thing is, and this is what I want to close with, it's at the end of all this, I've come to a state of mind that I call, and other people call too, it's not mine, <laughs> but I've come to acceptance. I've come to acceptance of what I am now, who I am now. And that, that can take a long time. That took me years to reach acceptance of my condition. I was on a prescription drug which damaged my central nervous system and is still causing problems. It's a fact. It just is. And I have to live with that. But I don't need to keep beating myself up about that. I need to accept where I'm at and do the best I can to move on. I'm a different person now. My personality has changed. But a lot of that change is good. My wife often tells me that the change is good. I'm not as materialistic as I used to be. I'm not as caught up in the grind and the fast-paced world out there. It's just not me. I don't find value in that anymore. I listen better. I listen more. I don't talk over people like I used to. I don't talk through people. <laughs> I mean, I was a talking machine before all this. But I don't do that as much now. I now really listen to what people say. I now want to hear what's going on. I now take things easy. I go for more walks. I like to be out in nature. I like to take my day one step at a time and not get overwhelmed in things. The changes I went through changed me, and a lot of those changes are for the better. Life is better on the other side. It just might take us a while to get there. So hang in there. If you're in the middle of this, hang in there. If you're getting ready to start out, remember that it gets better. It gets hard for a while, but it gets better. Just remember, again, my experiences are extreme, and yours will probably be easier. Hang in there. You're going to get through this. I did. Many people have, and you will too. Um, before we get to the moment of peace, which is what I'm calling that now, I think I called it something different the first episode, but I decided to go with moment of peace. I like that term. So before we do that, let me just briefly, really quickly insert my disclaimer here. So if you bear with me for about 25 seconds, I will tell you what you need to know. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical, health, or psychological advice, nor any other kind of personal or professional services. Withdrawal, tapering, or any change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, theanodiazepines, or any other prescription drug should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. Okay, and that brings us to our closing. Each week, um, I'm going to close out with a moment of peace, which is just basically a one minute of meditation. It's, all it is is to help calm your mind, you know, leave us in a more peaceful, more tranquil place than when we started. That's it. Just trying to quiet things down. So I'm going to kick this off, give a little introduction, and then I will play a soft bell. That'll begin the one minute. At the end of the one minute, I'll play another soft bell, might say a word or two, and then guess what? You can continue meditating if you like to. I highly encourage that. But if you don't want to, that's the end of the podcast, and I'll see you next episode. Before we dive in, I do want to mention something briefly. If you are going to join us on this um, moment of peace, remember that if you are driving or operating heavy machinery and in some place that is not safe, please do not close your eyes and please do not, you know, try to do this. It's, it's important that you are safe. Okay. But if you are in a safe place, close your eyes. Take a slow breath in, fill your lungs. And pause. Now let it out slowly. Let's do that again. Breathe in deeply, filling your belly with air. Pause for a second. And breathe out slowly. As you let it out, let all the stress of the day just pour out with that breath. Let's do that one more time. Breathe in. 
pause and breathe out slowly, letting all the stress pour out. And now just breathe normally. Just listen to yourself breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out. And today's suggestion is for you to focus on the sounds around you. Just listen. Don't evaluate as good or bad. Don't even try to identify what they are. Just listen to them. Notice them. And I'll catch you on the other side. And thank you for joining me today. Please don't forget to be kind to yourself, to those you love, to everyone. And have a good day.